Hey guys, welcome to Lingua Marina. Today I'm gonna to teach you how to get used of overused words in English. Saying I don't like it is a little offensive sometimes and Western culture and English language is all about being polite. It's all about being a little evasive about your true feelings because you don't want to hurt people. Like if somebody gives you a cake and you don't like it, you don't just say I don't like it. I don't like it! You're trying to be more polite in this situation. And before we start, please smash the like button below this video so the algorithm knows that this video is worth recommending to other English language students. And if you're not yet subscribed to this channel, there is a red button below, hit subscribe. Let's start with being polite aspect of this video. So what does that mean? When you don't like something, you don't just say, I don't like it. You start with something encouraging. When I was doing my filmmaking course in Los Angeles, um, I was learning to be a director of a movie. And whenever I didn't like the acting of some actors that were in my movie, I would tell them, hey, stop, I don't like it, let's do it again. My teacher would always approach me and tell me, Marina, you cannot do this in America. Maybe this is the Russian way to do it. And yes, this is the Russian way to do it. Russians are very straightforward. She told me that in America, what we do, we say, excuse me, I really like your acting. Um, you've done an amazing job. There's just one thing I wanted to um, change a little bit in the next shoot that we do. Maybe you could do this, this and that. So instead of just telling a person how bad they are, you actually tell them how great they are. And then you tell them, about things that can be worked on. And this is the way uh, to do that in the Western culture. And I actually like it. It makes me feel more at ease instead of just uh, receiving critics. Now that we're finished with the cultural aspect, we can go straight into the English language part. And with the English language part, you know, we've done a lot of classes on this channel um, where I help you replace different phrases. Like, I don't like it is one of those phrases. It's nice is one of those phrases. I try to teach you synonyms so you can diversify your speech. So in terms of I don't like it, you can say I dislike it, which is a little more advanced um, and it's a little more formal. So if you're in a formal meeting and somebody gives you a proposal, of course you start with, oh, the proposal is great. I like this and this aspect of it, but I dislike that you're doing this, this, and that. That's the way to tell it. I just like that expression immensely. You can also say, I'm not interested. You can say, your proposal is great, but I'm not really interested in jumping on it in the next few weeks because I'm on my maternity leave. Uh, instead of saying, I don't like it, you say, I'm not really interested. No, I'm not interested. If you're unhappy with somebody's actions, you can tell them, I don't really appreciate you being rude with me in public, for example. I don't appreciate it. Same way, it's a synonym to I don't like it. I don't appreciate it, okay? Now let's jump on to the informal section. I'm sure you've heard this hundreds of times. I'm not into it. And I'm not into you. I'm not into playing sports. I'm not into um, speaking other languages, just English. To be into something is to like something. And we're trying to diversify your speech and learn new phrases. So another way to say I don't like it um, is to say I'm not into it. I'm not into labels. And I've heard this phrase many times when um, there is a movie scene where um, a guy asks a girl to go out. The girl says, I'm not really into you. I'm sorry, I don't want to date you. That means that I don't really like you. I'm sorry, I don't want to date you. I'm not into you. I'm not fond of it. Another great phrase. I'll tell you my story where I can use this phrase. Uh, when I was 17 years old, I went into a theme park in St. Petersburg and there was an amazing roller coaster and I was super excited to be on it. But then um, there was this safety thing that was on top of me uh, and you go up and down and it's supposed to protect you and it flipped up when we were on the roller coaster. And I was so, so scared. So what I could do, I could actually drag it back to me. Uh, so at least I could feel safe. Uh, but I was so, so scared. I was only 17 years old and I've heard of people getting injured on such roller coasters. So since then, I'm not really fond of theme parks. And whenever I go to a theme park with uh, my friends, uh, I just don't take any roller coasters. I just watch them, maybe make a vlog, uh, take some pictures for Instagram, but I'm no longer fond of roller coasters because uh, I think I've got this trauma now and uh, I just don't want to risk my life. I'm not really fond of roller coasters. I'm not too fond of that name. 
I'm not crazy about it is another phrase and uh, I would use it when I go out for lunch um, and uh, somebody would tell me like hey do you want to grab sushi and I'm like yeah we could I'm not crazy about it which means I'm okay it's not like a strong phrase I'm okay we could grab sushi but I'm not really crazy about it maybe we could do pasta because uh, I'm crazy about Italian food that's an example I'm not crazy about it it's not for me another phrase for example uh, somebody tells you hey have you seen the latest Netflix TV show about a guy who murders people uh, all the time and you're like it's not for me I don't like that genre I like comedies I like love movies I like uh, sci-fi but I don't like watching other people kill other people so it's not for me it's not for me I'm not much of a and you insert a word person I'll give you an example my husband loves to go to movie theaters and uh, I just think that I can watch everything at home uh, once it's out and uh, I just don't see the point of going to movie theaters especially if the movie is a little weird we went to see once upon a time in Hollywood and I wish I actually read a story before I watched it I wish I could watch it at home so I could pause and read Wikipedia but we went to a movie theater uh, and I just had to watch it and I didn't really get it the time I watched it so I'm not much of a movie theater person I'm more of a person who stays at home and watches TV shows on Netflix I'm not much of a museum guy now the next phrase that you can say instead of saying I don't like it you can say I'll pass you're invited to go out on a Saturday night and you decide to stay home and learn a language so you tell your friends sorry guys I'll pass well probably if you're in America I wouldn't pass because then you can interact with native speakers but uh, for the learning purposes are you gonna say I'll pass so I'll pass means you're not really interested you don't like the idea of going somewhere you like the idea of staying at home and learning a language I'll pass thanks the next phrase is really direct and it's really straightforward and this isn't a phrase that you would use in a business meeting or in a formal interaction this is something that you would use with uh, really close friends like somebody is trying to kiss you on the cheek and you can tell them I can't stand it I don't like people kissing me all the time I can't stand people kissing me all the time so the phrase is I can't stand it again it's really strong I wouldn't use it in a business environment I wouldn't use it in a class I would only use it with your close friends I can't stand it anymore another strong phrase it drives me crazy and um, when you say it with the intonation that I've used right now people are gonna understand that you hate something it's even stronger than I don't like it it's actually hating the weather in the winter drives me crazy I hate snow I hate that it's always dark I feel depressed winter drives me crazy that just drives me crazy the next phrase is a little British it's not my cup of tea I'm losing my British accent I used to mimic it so close to reality but now eh, just gone I'm going to the UK this summer so hopefully I'll get it back but yeah it's not my cup of tea um, it's a way to say that again you don't like it um, it's just an expression that a lot of people use in Great Britain but I've also heard it in America yeah it's not my cup of tea but you know and the last but not the least is very American it's not my thing it's not my thing you know you can use it for almost anything if somebody is asking you what kind of sport do you do you say eh, it's not my thing I don't do sports at all I just sit at home and watch TV it's not my thing. hey how are you you hear this phrase all the time and uh, I'm sure you have a reflex to answer I'm fine thank you this was like your first English class at school right but the thing is what we've learned at school is not always applicable in real life in America for example if you're asked how are you in the majority of cases people don't care uh, which means that your answer should depend on whether people care or not and I'm fine thank you is really well kind of old-fashioned so today I'm gonna teach you how to reply to how are you in different situations and with different people so if you're interested continue watching first 
let's look at some quick phrases that you can use. You would use those phrases with acquaintances or strangers. What does it mean? When you come to a grocery store and uh, the cashier asks you, how are you? This is a stranger and uh, you don't want to tell them that, you know, everything is bad and you have to pay this college bill or whatever. Or somebody sitting next to you in a bus or you're riding in an elevator. Like I ride in an elevator every day. I meet my neighbors and they always, how are you? It doesn't mean they're really interested. How am I? They just want to start a conversation. Those people are also strangers. Actually in the United States, when people ask you, how are you? Sometimes it's equal to hello uh, and uh, it's not really a question. So in this situation, it's better to give a short answer because you don't want to be too daunting with explaining what's going on in your life. The first short answer is not bad, which depending on your intonation can be either positive or neutral. So if you say not bad, that means everything is okay, everything is going well. You can also say eh, not bad, which is neutral or not bad. This is positive. Not bad. The next phrase you can say, all right. Again, here, it means you're fine and everything depends on your intonation. All right, is like, okay, neutral. Everything's all right. Positive, you know, you're enjoying your life. I'm all right. The next thing you can say, good. I'm good. And sometimes you think that saying I'm good is grammatically incorrect because when we're talking about actions, um, we normally use adverbs instead of adjectives. So for example, saying we danced good is wrong, we danced well is better. But because in this sentence you're actually saying I am good or you can just say good, it makes it grammatically correct. So don't worry about it. I'm good is a completely grammatically correct phrase. And it means that you're happy, everything is going well in your life. So I'm good. This is the last answer that I'm giving you when you reply to strangers. So let's repeat them. Not bad, all right, good. Very short, kind of informal, and uh, you don't waste other people's time because you remember that how are you is just a way of saying hello and being polite. But if you're talking to your friends, if you're talking to your family members, if you're talking to somebody who's really close, it's actually impolite to just tell them like, eh, I'm okay whatever, I'm good. You want to be more explicit. You want to go into details because these people actually care about you and they want to know what's going on in your life. You can say, I'm exhausted. You're really tired. There are a lot of things going on at work and uh, you really want to complain, then do it. That's a perfect situation to complain because you're talking to your friends. I'm exhausted. If you tell your friend that you're okay, Sometimes if he's really worried about you, he might ask you, just okay? And this will be an appropriate follow-up question because they might notice that something is not well, uh, that something's going on, so they want more honesty from you. I'm okay. You can say, I'm frustrated. My aunt in San Francisco, she just got a new job and uh, we met for dinner and I was like, how are you? And she's like, I'm frustrated. Uh, there's this coworker who is so annoying, who is a, he's actually below her, so she manages him and he's trying to tell her what to do all the time. And she said, I'm frustrated. I don't know how to deal with him. I don't know how to settle in this new working space because this guy keeps telling me what to do when um, in the reality, I'm his manager. Totally appropriate phrase to answer a question. How are you? I'm frustrated. All right, I'm just frustrated. If a friend calls you and you know he would always call when he has free time and wants to talk, you can tell them, hey, I'm busy. Uh, you know, I'm recording a video for my Lingua Marina channel. I'm gonna call you back in uh, half an hour. I'm busy. I'm busy. You see what we're talking about here is giving people more details about how you're actually feeling. And the next phrase is stressed out. Uh, how are you? I'm so stressed out right now. Uh, you know, I have exams coming in a week. Um, I have to apply for a job. I have to apply for a visa, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot going on in your life and you are under this pressure. I'm so stressed out. By the way, in the task for you, 
after this video is to tell me how you are <laughs> and uh, I'm asking you how are you and if you already have a phrase in mind write it down in comments below and tell me what's going on in your life let's make it more informal let's make it in a way that friends and relatives do tell me how you're feeling what's going on in your life using one of those phrases um, that you're learning right now another very common phrase I've been better normally it's followed up by actually complaining about something or explaining what's going on in your life and uh, why right now is not the best time why you're not enjoying your life right now and um, if you say I've been better I will probably ask what's going on why I've been better if everything is great if you don't want to go into too many details you can just say I'm great everything is great how are you I'm great and the last but not the least, if something is coming up in your life, you're having a baby, you're heading out to a concert, you are getting a new job, you can say, I'm excited. I'm excited. And uh, don't forget that when people ask you, especially your friends, when they ask you how you are, and uh, when you tell them what's going on in your life, it's very important that you also ask them back what's going on in their lives because this is the way you start a conversation this is the way you're being polite and uh, maintaining relationship with people who matter to you hey guys welcome to my channel this is Lingo Marina what is your natural reaction to this? what? what 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 what? this is the way a lot of you ask people to repeat things you just say what? or you say what? or you say what? And depending on intonation, people can get offended. If you say what, this is really impolite. If you say what, people will think you'll be surprised. So there are other ways to ask people to repeat something. And we're gonna talk about these things in today's video. several ways to ask people to repeat information and we're gonna start with formal ways a very formal way to ask people for more information is uh, very British uh, British people say pardon pardon me pardon and uh, when they say they mean that they didn't get what you were saying so you're supposed to repeat things you can also say sorry so sorry what or excuse me so when you don't understand something you just say excuse me excuse me and with the intonation and maybe you show your ear people would understand that they need to repeat things the most formal way is i beg your pardon i beg your pardon which is also i'm trying to pronounce it with a british accent because i've never heard american people say i beg your pardon maybe they do but i've heard that a lot more often in great britain in london i beg your pardon there are also some certain phrases that would help you out in this situation you can say Excuse me, I didn't catch you. Could you repeat this again, please? Or you can say, I am sorry, I don't understand. Can you repeat, please? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Or if you want to be even more polite, you can say, could you repeat, please? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? If somebody is saying a word or expression that you hear for the first time, you can say, excuse me, I hear this word for the first time, or this word is new for me. Could you explain what it means? Or you can say, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by, and then add this word. For example, I say, I feel a little under the weather today. And you're like, under the weather? Feel under the weather? And you can say, I'm sorry, what do you mean by saying under the weather? What does that expression mean? And I would go ahead and explain that I'm feeling a little sick today, which is not true, thankfully. Of course, there are informal ways of asking people to repeat things, but please make sure you maintain the right intonation. Because for example, the phrase, what did you say, can be said in two different ways. You can say, what did you say? What did you say? What? And uh, if you're chatting to a friend, that is totally fine. The friend would repeat. But if you're talking to a stranger and you use the wrong intonation, what did you just say? What did you say? that could be perceived as a way to start a fight. So I wouldn't really use this phrase with that intonation. Another informal way is just to say, huh? 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 
people would understand that they need to repeat. It's spelled like H-U-H and you see that a lot in different texts or in different books that are informal. Americans love to contract words and instead of excuse me, sometimes they just say excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. So there is no eh in the beginning. Excuse me. You can also say what was that? For example, somebody's telling you about things they're gonna do tomorrow and you didn't catch what they were saying and you're like, what was that? And they're gonna repeat. What was that? What was what? And the last phrase in this informal section is uh, something that can be used when you were focused on a different thing. For example, you were reading a book or you were meditating and somebody started talking to you and you're like, you stop meditating, you're like, hmm? Hmm. Hmm. This is H-M-M-M, if you spell it. And this phrase would let people know that you didn't catch what they were saying. Let's talk about some slang phrases that will mean the same thing, asking people to repeat information. You can say, come again. Come again. Very American, very widely used. Come again. You can also say, pass that by me again, which is not that widely used. If you don't understand something and you're giving up, you can just say, I don't get it. I'm sorry, I don't get it. I don't get it. Maybe you've been trying to understand that person several times and you uh, tried saying, excuse me, and you tried saying, I don't understand this expression, and you tried saying, what do you mean? And you know, at the end, you're just uh, giving up and you just say, I don't think I get it. And I wanted to wrap up this class with idioms. And remember, idioms are phrases that you cannot translate verbatim, which means word to word. Because if you try to translate them word to word into your own language, you're gonna get something that doesn't make any sense okay idioms this is all Greek to me that means I don't understand a word I think our wires are crossed I think maybe we got our wires crossed about tonight that's an idiom with the exact same meaning that was as clear as mud this actually makes sense because mud is not clear. Mud is dirty and uh, if something is as clear as mud, uh, that means you can't see through, it's non-transparent, you don't understand. I can't make heads or tails of what you're saying. That's another idiom meaning I don't understand you. Everything you said is just a word salad. Uh, this is an amazing phrase. And I know some other languages have the same phrase. Uh, I remember German language has Ich höre nur die Bahnhof, which means um, I only hear railway station, which means I don't understand anything. I, it, it sounds super weird to me. So English language has the same phrase. By the way, if you're watching from Germany, comment down below uh, which city you're from. I'm a fan of Dresden uh, because I studied there. And yeah, the English expression is everything you said is just a word salad. Saying I don't know all the time is really boring. And there are amazing phrases used by native speakers that would help you replace this phrase and make your speech more natural and more exciting to listen to. So if you're interested, continue watching this video. When somebody asks you about something you don't know, you can reply, that's a good question. I'll find out. That's a good question. When I just started my company, MP Education, and we sent people to study abroad, there were a lot of questions that came from our customers that I didn't know the answer to. But if I just said, I don't know, I would sound maybe unprofessional because as a professional in study abroad, I had to know answer to that question. And that might have sounded a little dismissive. The client might have gotten an impression that I didn't want to help them. So if you are working with customers, if you are trying to show that you want to help, the best response is something that I've just mentioned. That's a good question. I'll find out. Sometimes saying, I don't know, just stops the conversation. And maybe that person who is asking you a question wants to continue talking to you. And if you want to continue this friendly conversation, you can say, I have the exact same question. I could ask you the same question. For example, your friend asks you, when do you think uh, the quarantine will be over? When would we be able to freely travel? And I know Europeans are already able to do that. And you can say, I don't know, because of course you don't know what's gonna happen. But if you want to continue conversation, you can say, I have the exact same question. I had plans to go to Europe this summer. I had plans to study abroad. And uh, you know, I don't want when this would be over. I have my flights booked, I have my hotel booked, and I'm just sitting here and waiting. So instead of saying, I don't know, you would say, I have the exact same question. And this way, the conversation would continue and you would sound friendlier. 
Another phrase is really conversational, widely used by native speakers. Instead of saying, I don't know, you can say, I have no idea. I have no idea. And another phrase that is a little more advanced, I would say, I have no clue. I have no clue where we are. I have no clue is basically the same as I have no idea. It just makes your speech a little different. The next phrase is rhetorical. It is a question that people don't expect an answer to. So for example, when somebody tells you, do you know when the stores are gonna open again? You can say, who knows? Who knows? And the meaning is the same. I don't have a clue. I don't know. Who knows? The next phrase is really informal, uh, used by teenagers, used by a lot of people. It sounds like, I don't know, but it's a faster version of it. So it's like, don't know. I don't know. And uh, it's spelled with five letters only. Don't know. Do you know when they serve McBreakfast and McDonald's? Don't know. Mm -mm. So this is a fast phrase, same meaning as I don't know. And it's really widespread among teenagers. The next phrase is, why don't we ask? And then you insert somebody's name. Hey, why don't we ask her? For example, you have this Zoom meeting because everything is happening in Zoom right now. You have this Zoom meeting with your colleagues or with other students from your group. And somebody raises a question. When do you think we should organize the next meeting? If they address this question to you, you can say, why don't we ask Ben? Because Ben is the one who's responsible for organizing all of the meetings for a group. And this way you are owning the conversation instead of saying i don't know you are actually redirecting the question to another person and uh, you're kind of staying in charge which is a great thing um, especially in a group it's good when somebody is navigating the questions so you can say why don't we ask ben ben when do you think we should organize the next meeting your guess is as good as mine your guess is as good as mine this phrase is Oh my God, it's beautiful, right? I would say I would use it if I was making a movie, if I was making a very beautiful vlog. I would say, instead of saying, I don't know, I would say, your guess is as good as mine. That means that I have no idea as well. I have no answer to your question and I could only guess and my guess would be as good as yours and your guess would be as good as mine. If you're really annoyed by somebody's question, Somebody has been asking you this question every single day. You know, babies or kids, uh, they love to ask the same question. For example, when you're in the airplane and you're waiting to take off, the kids would be like, when will we take off? When will we take off? I remember myself doing that. And when you're flying, the kids would be like, when are we gonna arrive? When are we gonna arrive? Kids are amazing, uh, but there are some people who are annoying asking the same question. You can get back to them with a phrase, how should I know? How should I know? Like. Why do you think I should have this information? You asked me yesterday, I told you, I don't know. You asked me the day before yesterday, I told you, who knows? You know, you answered with the phrases that we've learned in this class. And uh, when you're so annoyed with a question, you can just say, how should I know? Come on, why do you think I have this knowledge? And when I first came to the UK, my friend told me, send loads of love to your parents and I was like, wow, I'm used to lots of love, but I'm not used to L-O-A-D-S, loads of love. And that sounded cool. And I started using it. And later I realized there are so many words that you can use instead of a lot of. And uh, we made up this list together with my team and I'm gonna teach you what to use instead of a lot. So if you're interested in diversifying your speech in sounding more advanced, continue watching this video and keep writing new things down because this is the way you remember and later use them. A great deal means a large amount. So instead of saying, I know a lot of K-pop music, you can say, I know a great deal of K-pop music. That sounds a lot cooler, right? Great deal about monsters, but... Ample means enough or more than enough. Another word is plentiful. In case of another lockdown, I have ample stores of food and water. I think this is almost everyone in the US because people bought so many things in the past few months. Ample. That should provide us ample time. Abundance is a word used for a great quantity of something. Paris is a city that have an abundance of fine restaurants. 
It means it has a lot of fine restaurants, but abundance sounds a lot nicer. And by the way, if you're taking any tests or if you are doing academic writing, academic speaking, make sure you learn at least three or five of these words by heart and learn how to use them. Because on every test, you will be graded according to the level of vocabulary that you're using. And if throughout the test, you will be like a lot, a lot, a lot. And during your speaking, be a lot, a lot, a lot. And during your university interview, you'll be like a lot, a lot, a lot. People will be like, oh my God, does he know or does she know any other words? And uh, if you watch this video, you'll be like, oh yeah, I do. Marina taught me some. There's an abundance of characters. Enormously means to a very great degree or extent. So this is an adverb. The quality of life varies enormously from one place to another. Enormously. Enormously dangerous consequences. Heaps means a large amount or number of. I've got heaps of work to do. Oodles of love and heaps of good wishes from Cam. Legion uh, means a great number and legion is normally used when we're talking about a group of people. After graduating from a university, I have a legion of new friends. That means I have a huge group of new friends. <gasps> Adoring legion of fans. The next one is loads, a lot of or many. And this is what my British friend Catherine uses. Uh, whenever she writes a letter or an email, she uh, writes loads of love to your family from me. X, X, X. This is kiss, kiss, kiss. Has loads of insecurities. Masses is a synonym for a large number of people. The masses will be voting on Tuesday. That means a lot of people, the majority of people will be voting on Tuesday. Great masses of humanity. Myriad historically means a unit of 10,000, but it also means a lot. Throughout the life, a person encounters myriads of concepts. So verbatim, if we're gonna explain it, throughout the life the person encounters tens of thousands of new concepts. Of oh, the myriad of treasures we have got. Plenty means a sufficient number or sometimes more than enough. I would have plenty of time to get home before my parents arrive. That means I will have more than enough time to get home. There's plenty of people. Plethora, an excessive amount of something. Plethora. There is a plethora of books about the royal family. There is a plethora of books about economics. There is a plethora of books on anything. Would you say I have a plethora of piñatas? Reams means a very large amount of something. Again, the same as a lot of. They had reams of data to prove their point. They have a lot of data to prove their point. Reams. <laughs> Scads, large number or quantity. Again, a lot. I've got scads of letters to write. Scads of lobsters all in a tank. Slew, a large amount or a number. You can find a slew of books on the shelf. There's a slew of cyborgs roaming this part. Again, these words are not something that you would use every five minutes when you speak English, but you would encounter them when you read a book, when you talk to a native speaker, when you read an article. And sometimes you see the words cats and you're like, is that a lot or is that a little? And sometimes the meaning changes completely if you don't understand one single word. So just make sure you kind of try and remember what they mean. I don't expect you to use them right away in your speech, but at least start to recognize them, start to acknowledge that these words exist. And I want to wrap up with the word tons, which means much a lot of. I feel tons better. That means I feel a lot better. It will mean tons to me if you like this video and subscribe to this channel if you enjoyed watching it. And if you guys want to grow your vocabulary by even more words, there is a resource called English Out Online. This is where I posted my workbook in English and it has a lot of useful vocabulary, a lot of idioms, a lot of phrasal verbs that are gonna make you sound like a native speaker. The link will be below. Download it and start improving your English today. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you really soon in my next vlogs. Bye.